check, check, check. Praise the Lord, everybody. Why don't we make our way to our seat? We can get ready to learn in Jesus' name. Everybody say, I love Jesus. Oh, it's more than just a phrase. It's reality. He's so good and so glad to be home with every one of you. Glad to hear about the great things that God did on Sunday and uh, glad to be spending our fifth year anniversary together uh, this Sunday. And uh, we will see what we're going to eat. Still undecided and uh, gonna going to let my stomach do some meditating. Amen. All right, let's begin with the word of prayer. Let's ask God to help us. We are on week 24. Man, that's a long time. And I love it. I love Jesus. Let's pray. Ask God to help us tonight. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. It's always a privilege to open up your word and learn from you. Praying that your presence is with us in a special way. God, speak to us. Open our understanding to the scriptures. Help us understand everything you were trying to teach your disciples. Let it be taught to us tonight. Bless us, Jesus, as we open up the word of God and hear your voice. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. 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 This is like tripping me out. I'm going to raise this a little higher here. And uh, I don't think I grew, but well, in Jesus' name, hallelujah. All right, let us turn our attention to Matthew 15, 21. And we're just going to dive right in and continue with what we have been learning. We've been learning about Jesus, and uh, we're about to transition into a uh, story that God decided he wanted us to know about, about Jesus. And we're going to go ahead and just dive in and start expounding on it to see exactly what he wants us to learn from this. So Matthew 15 and 21, this is what the scripture says. It says, then Jesus went thence, departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Now... The very first question, if, if uh, I believe most of you guys were here when we read Matthew 11. And so in Matthew 11, these, these, these two cities are mentioned. So we have to ask ourselves the question, why is Jesus going there? Because Jesus is, Jesus is leaving uh, Israeli territory and he's going into a Gentile territory, okay? Um, you know, and we'll talk about that here in a second. But if we can get to Matthew 11, 21, so we can see what Jesus says about these two areas... He says, Woe unto the Chorazin, woe unto the Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. So just a heads up, if you don't understand the context of this in Matthew 15, what is going on is that to the Jews... Tyre and Sidon is literally synonymous with wickedness. In other words, this is a wicked place. They're unrepentable. They're unsavable. And yet Jesus uses them, an ex uses them in an example that there's more hope for this sinful area than there is for the Jewish people. Okay? And then now Jesus doesn't just tell them that story. He also, now he takes off and he starts heading in that, in that direction. So, one of the things that's fascinating, and you'll see this as this story unfolds about his particular visit to Tyre and Sidon, is, is one of the things that Jesus is teaching us implicitly through this behavior is he's actually teaching us that he's willing to go to places that others aren't. He's willing to go into places that others aren't. Now, I'm not, I, I have to clarify this because I know how the flesh works. Uh, I, I can already see somebody saying, that's why I go to the bars on Saturday. <laughs> so I, I got to bring, I got to clarify what I'm saying because I just know how the flesh works. The flesh will be like, yeah, that's why we, that's why we go to parties and get drunk because I'm just trying to save people that are there. And it's like, no, you're actually just going there to party and get drunk. Okay. Jesus is, Jesus is going into the places that others are not willing to go as an example to us for the future that Christians will be the people that are willing to help save others that religious folks are not. Amen. Okay, he's, he's set in a tone for the future of Christianity by showing us that the untouchables, the unsavables, the wicked, the dirty, uh, people from different cultures and backgrounds and ideologies, the ones that nobody cares about, that Christians would be the ones that could see them for who they are, humans made in the image of God that need salvation. Amen. Christianity would be that because even Judaism couldn't see that. Okay? That's why I'm not Jewish, and I thank God I'm not Jewish. 
because I would be judging people based on skin and, and are you part of this or that and this and genealogy. Listen, none of that matters when the Messiah gets involved. Okay, and that's why I love Christianity. So, as Christians, we must be willing to see all people saved, not just our preferences. We all have preferences. Oh, I'd love to be sitting next to this type of person. God says, I don't really care what you want to be sitting next to. I want to save people. I want to deliver people. I want to break uh, genealogical curses. I want to stretch my hands out into sinners and bring them in and change their life. God does not take our preferences into consideration when it comes to saving people. I remember the story of a powerful man that started probably one of the fastest growing jail ministries. The story goes like this. He walked into to church, this nasty drunkard, cussing in the back and smelly, overweight, just nasty, smelt bad, drunkard. And one of the wealthiest tithe payers came to the pastor and said, hey, you got to get your ushers to get him out of here. And the pastor said, I, I'm not going to kick him out. This man needs Jesus. And the man said, either he goes or, or I go. Well, guess what the pastor said? The pastor said, man, I hate to see you leave, but don't let the door hit you. He lost his biggest tithe payer. But he gained one of the greatest soul winners in the Jesus name movement that ever took place. You just never know what walks in those back doors. And so you just can't look at them and say, oh, get rid of him because he looks like nothing. That's because you're carnal. You need to look at them through the lens of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Now let's see what happens next, because you know how Jesus is. If you're hanging out with Jesus, something's always going to happen. So let's see what happens. He shows up into Tyre and Sidon. This is a Gentile area. OK, and the Bible says, and behold, a woman of Canaan came out with uh, out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. Now, I love how the Bible wants us to know that she is a woman of Canaan. In other words, she is a Gentile. Okay? She's not a covenant child. She's someone outside access to Judaism. So she comes to Jesus, a Gentile woman, and she lets Jesus know, hey, I got needs. Okay, What does that mean? That means even Gentiles have needs. Even Gentiles fight devils. Even Gentiles need miracles. Even people outside our little sphere, our little world, are going through things that we may not understand. Okay, and we have to be willing to bring them to Jesus. Now, what I want to know is I want to know who told her about Jesus. Because that's the person that's going to get credit for this miracle. Who told her, hey, Gentile woman, come to Jesus? Who told her, hey, go through the coast and, and you find him? Now, we read these stories and we don't put ourselves in, in, in the shoes of this woman. You know how hard it is to track Jesus down? Like, Jesus would be like America's most wanted. He, he literally was sporadic. He would just, you never see him say like, hey, I, I, I'm going to be at this place at this time. He, he didn't share his schedule. It was either you were ready or you caught him or you didn't. And so this woman, I can only imagine when she heard that there was someone that can heal her daughter, she was like, all right, where do I find him? Well, the last time I saw him, he was in Israel. She goes to Israel. Hey, have you guys seen Jesus around? Well, he was here, but we think he got on a boat. And then he goes, she, goes, she goes over to the shipyard, and she's like, hey, y'all seen Jesus? Yeah, he got on a boat with his disciples, and he went towards those coasts. And then she gets on a boat and starts making her way to the coast, and she's like, anybody seen Jesus around? Well, we think he's either, he's in Tyre or Sidon. Most of us would have quit after we found out he left Israel. But she took the journey. What she needed mattered enough for her to go and try to find Jesus. Somebody said amen. Now, when she gets to Jesus, now this, is, this trips me out. When she gets to Jesus, you would think that Jesus would respond differently. Okay? She shows up. She, she 
unloads her needs to him, lets him know, I need you. My daughter is jacked up. She'd be getting devil's mess with her. Jesus, I, I came all the way from another place to find you. I tracked you down. I need your help. And the Bible tells us in the next verse, verse 23, and he answered her not a word. He gave her the silent treatment. How many guys like the silent treatment? Oh, man, the silent. You know what happens when you get the silent treatment? When you get the silent treatment, your mind can't go silent. I'm teaching better than you realize. When you get the silent treatment, you start talking for the other person. Our minds are that jacked up. We, man, someone just, just doesn't answer you, and you start, he doesn't like me. She doesn't like me. She thinks this about me. She looked at me. And, and the other person's just like, I haven't said a word. <laughs> Jesus goes silent on this woman. Now, what's amazing is Jesus went silent on her, but evidently she didn't go silent on Jesus because she kept bugging the disciples enough. The Bible says, and his disciples came and beside him saying, send her away. She crieth after us. She was annoying the disciples. Now, here's my question. Why would Jesus not answer her the first time? We all like to be immediately responded to. Does anybody remember the, the parable of the wicked judge and the persistent widow and look in Luke 18? There almost seems to be this, this paradox in Jesus. It's like, how bad do you really want it? Like, are you like, do you need a miracle bad enough to pray once about it? Or do you need a miracle bad enough to keep on bugging me about it? Isn't that amazing how that works? How Jesus is like, no, I'm, I'm going to teach you some stuff right now. You know what's amazing about the disciples, though? I, I told God, I was like, man, the disciples rubbed me wrong in this verse. They, they kind of bothered me, and the, the Holy Ghost told me, well, they didn't have the Holy Ghost yet, so calm down. And I said, all right. Isn't it amazing how when people don't struggle with what you struggle, they find it easy to not empathize or sympathize with you, so they just want you to go away. Listen, I don't know how you feel. I don't know what you're going through. And honestly, you're kind of bothering me. You keep showing up every Sunday crying over the same thing. Can you just leave? That's how the flesh thinks. The flesh is like, hey, bro, can you just like stop? Because it's kind of annoying. But you know what's amazing is, is that you don't know the struggle of seeing your daughter vexed by a devil. Well, Hallelujah. Hey, can I tell you, as Christians, we must learn both to empathize and sympathize with others and not write them off so easily. We must learn. We must actually learn. Can you believe this? You, 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 this is actually bothers me. They, they wanted to send her away. Instead, they could have gone to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, can you answer her request so that she can go home to her daughter?" But instead, they're complaining about her crying instead of crying unto him because of her. Hey, can I tell you, when God raises you up as a Christian, he raises you up so that you can be sympathetic and empathetic towards the needs of others, even if you don't understand what they're going through. You can't just write people off because you're not struggling the way they are. Well, pastor, this woman, man, you just, I, I just can't sympathize and I can't empathize with her. I'm not asking you to master it overnight, but you should have the Holy Ghost inside of you that should hear the cry and the need of somebody else. And you should be able to go to God and say, God, I know she's praying because I can tell and I can hear her crying, crying and praying about this. So I'm going to back her up by praying also. Hey, can you imagine what would happen if more people prayed for one another instead of criticized one another? Man, our poor disciples, they needed the Holy Ghost to learn how to do this. It takes the Holy Ghost sometimes to do these things. Somebody said amen. amen. Verse 24, look at this. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I want you to notice this. He did not speak to her. This is his response to the disciples. 
Now, can you imagine being right there, being the woman, and you're, you're the one crying about your miracle, and Jesus don't even talk to you. He's talking to his disciples. Oh, you ain't hearing me. He reality checks his disciples, and what do you think she heard when she heard that? She heard no. She heard Jesus just said no to my need. Jesus just said no to my request. Jesus just said no. You know what's amazing about us? Sometimes God don't say no. Sometimes we think he said no. Sometimes we assume it's a no because he doesn't initially respond the way we think. So we, you know, this woman could have been like, well, I guess it's a no. I'm going to pack up. I got to get out of here. It was a long trip to get here, so I'm about to get ready to bounce. Hey, let me ask you a question. What would you do if you thought God said no? Man, you'd get that Greyhound ticket home. You'd get that Greyhound ticket back to your daughter fighting the devil. You'd find another way to try to figure this out. Now, this is why God put her in the Bible. What did she do? Look what the Bible says in the next verse. Then came she and got offended at Jesus. Then came she, packed her bags, and left Jesus. The Bible says she thought she heard a no, but she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Now, I, I want to challenge you here today. She asked and she heard not a word initially. She annoyed the disciples, and then she heard Jesus talk to the disciples and possibly perceived a no. And out of all of her options that she has at her disposal and very justifiable, his disciples are trying to get me out of here. He's not talking to me. I have every reason to walk out on Jesus and walk away. And she decides to worship him. Hey, where did the idea, maybe I should worship him, come from? Because that's the last thing I would be thinking of. It's like, maybe if I worship. I'm teaching better than you're responding right now. Where is, man, listen, I want to learn from this woman. In her mind, I'm not even going to ask again until I first worship. See, she started worshiping and then she asked again. There seems to be a revelation that she doesn't even know exists about Jesus. Matthew 7, ask you shall receive. Luke 18, the principle, the persistent woman. She's literally acting out these things that Jesus said and she doesn't even know about them. Look at this. Some people, and trust me, I've been pastoring for a little bit, and I've been living for God quite a bit. Some people only worship if they get a yes. Some folks, hey, you ain't God. I, ain't, I got nothing to worship you about. I ain't worshiping you. I got needs that you haven't answered yet. So when you answer my needs, then I'm going to worship you. This is why some people will show up on Sunday and they won't worship God because they're thinking I'm waiting on God to answer my needs and then I'll worship him. And they don't realize God's waiting for you to worship to answer your needs. So this woman decides, hey, you know what? I'm not going to wait for a yes to give him some worship and I'm not going to wait for a yes to worship him. In fact, I'm willing to worship him. Him after a no. See, I've seen people run the aisles and jump and shout and cry and praise God over God saying yes to something. I've seen very few people that can get a no from God and still say, I'm still going to praise you. You know what's amazing? What did Job say? Yet though he slay me, yet will I worship. Isn't it amazing about that there are some people that it's not about the yes or the no, it's about the relationship. And so here you got this woman, and I love this because she gives us a revelation that sometimes a no can turn into a yes if we'll worship him. 
As Christians, we must understand and learn the power of worship because there's some people that literally lock themselves away from their own miracles because they're selfish. God, what can you do for me? And then I'll do something for you. And God says, see, that's your problem. You haven't learned yet that you don't deserve anything from me. And I deserve everything from you. Why? Because I gave you breath. And the scripture says, let everything that has breath praise you, the Lord. See, God, from God's perspective, I don't owe you anything. You owe me everything. And this woman, is, she's about to learn this right now. Now, did worship alone unlock her miracle? No. But it did set her in the right direction. It takes humility to worship. So her worship is literally posturing her for the truth she's about to get. Some people think that we just have a worship service before service just because we're bored. No, it's because, believe it or not, worship will prepare you for some hard truths. You know, God will tell you, you know, I love you, I love you, I love you. And then you're like, oh, yeah, that's cool, that's cute. And then all of a sudden the pastor will preach or the preacher will preach. And you're like, that stung. You should have been worshiping. You would have been ready for it. If you would have prepared your heart, if you would have prepared your mind, the preaching would have went forth, and you would have been like, man, you know what? That's true. I am a sly dog. Y'all, see, y'all don't believe me. That's how Jesus did it. Look at this. He answered and said, it is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. Talk about a sermon. Jesus is painting a reality of her Gentile idol worshiping lifestyle. He's painting a reality check of her current status and condition. Jesus, ain't, Jesus is literally preaching raw. He's doing to her exactly what he did to the woman with the, uh, the, woman with the, the guy she was sleeping with in John 4. He said, you're right. You've been honest. That's good for you. You shacked up with five husbands. The guy you're with right now is not your man. Appreciate you being truthful. Here Jesus is giving her some truth. Why is Jesus doing this? Because he's bored and wants to hurt her feelings? No, absolutely not. Jesus is trying to help her see herself. Jesus is trying to help her understand the reality of her being undeserving to get his help. Not to hurt her, but to help her. Why? Jesus is trying to help her have, everybody say, realistic. realistic. Jesus is developing realistic expectations in her. In other words, Jesus is saying, hey, I hope you realize you don't deserve my help. Your lifestyle, your past, your present, the, your behavior, who you worship, what you do, you don't deserve me to give you bread. Why is he trying to unlock this? Because he's trying to also teach her how good he is. See, sometimes God has to give us some harsh truths so that you can realize how good he really is. See, when God helps you see how jacked up you are, it helps you view him through the lens of God is good. But see, it takes some reality checks. And Jesus is trying to teach her how to accept the truth. He's trying to teach her how to accept reality. As Christians, believe it or not, we too must learn to accept God's truth even if it hurts our feelings, because ultimately it's meant to help us. Now, I want to emphasize that here for a second, because I think this is very important for a Christian to understand this. God doesn't want to hurt your feelings. God understands that your reality causes feelings, and when he challenges your reality, it's going to hurt your feelings. It's not that God's going out of his way to hurt your feelings. It's that this perception you have has feelings that aid the perception. So whether he likes it or not, when he tells you something that goes against your perception, it's going to affect your feelings. And it's not because he doesn't love you and it's not because he's trying to hurt you. He's trying to help you accept reality. A bad trainer is a trainer that tells you you're doing all right when your blood pressure is like through the roof and you got like borderline diabetes. Oh, you look great. You a liar. I've never met someone that someone told them the truth and they're like, man, that feels so good. 
Hey, listen, you tell someone the truth, all of a sudden they get all offended at you, and you're like, I understand. Feelings are attached. I get it. I get it. We all get defensive. Trust me. I'm human. Everybody say, I'm human. What is she going to do? What is this woman going to do? Well, let's see what God says. She said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs that which fall from the master's table. Now, I want you to pay attention and highlight this verse. This response changed her life. This response changed her daughter's life. And this response evicted the devil's power off their lives. I want you to pay it. There are responses that can change your destiny. And the response here is real simple. She agreed and she was humble enough to say that is the truth. Hey, accepting reality is not easy. I'm just telling you. Who likes to be told that they're not all that they think they are? Man, when I'm like praying and the Holy Ghost is like, you ain't all right, you're cut out to be Jack, and you're just like, hala, but well, what? What you talking about? It takes humility to receive truth. Okay? Now I want you to pay real close attention to what happens because of this. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Now, I want, I want you to emphasize this. Her reaction caused a chain reaction from Jesus. See, how you respond to Jesus will also affect how he responds to you. If you would have just said, Man, this guy's a jerk. I'm out. Jesus would have been like, why? Because if he would have sent her away with her miracle before she had a reality check that she was a Gentile, heathen, idol-worshipping woman, she would have got her deliverance, but she still would have went to hell. See, there's a lot of people that want the miracle without the truth. But Jesus was teaching us that the truth is more important than the miracle. You don't believe that? Why do you think the Antichrist comes with lying, signs, and wonders? See, you can, you can, you can go to hell with two good arms and two good legs. But Jesus is showing us that there's something powerful about him being able to tell you, hey, listen, you're worshiping the wrong things, you're living the wrong way, and you're on your way to hell. And there's, there's a greater issue that you got. You know what's amazing about Jesus? Jesus is not even addressing the fact that there's a devil whooping up on her daughter. You know what Jesus' greatest concern is? Your daughter may be fighting a devil, you're living like one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's well, why when you walk into an environment, the preacher starts to preach on the stuff you're living and doing and worshiping, and you get uncomfortable about it. And you're like, I just came here for a miracle, man. Yeah, the miracle is that God's trying to save you. All the other stuff's extra. We got to get that revelation, okay? Now, I love Jesus because he's so nice. He compliments her faith. He calls it great faith. Can you show them what regular faith looks like? Hebrews 11 and 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's faith. Jesus is saying, this chick don't have faith. This chick has great faith. Okay? What makes her faith great? Is it the persistence? Is it the fact that she now has faith in Jesus as being the only one that can help her? Is it her humility? Is it her willingness to accept the truth? Is it her hunger? Is it her worship? What exactly makes her faith great? I think it's, I actually think it's all of it. I think all of that builds it to be something stronger than just faith. 
And what happens? Jesus releases this miracle because of her great faith. Now, here's a simple revelation that sometimes we overlook. Some miracles take more than just faith. Some miracles take great faith. Some miracles take persistence and humility. Some miracles take keeping at it. I met a, a uh, I just got done preaching in a hilltop, and I had a 40, uh, she was probably, what, 80 years old or so. She's an elder. She told me some awesome stories. She said, brother, she said, when I was young, a, a whore, you know, in the southern girls, she said, a horse kicked me in the mouth, and my, all my teeth fell out. My mom grabbed the teeth, put them in my mouth, and prayed in Jesus' name, and they all got back in there. And I'm just like, that's awesome. And then she said, brother, I moved here just a few, you know, a few weeks ago because my husband died. That's what she said. And I said, okay. And I said, tell me more about this. And she said, oh, yeah, I moved here. My husband's in heaven now. And I said, oh, that's wonderful. And I thought, man, maybe, you know, maybe they were just in church the whole life. She said, 47 years and eight months. What? I said, is that how long you were married? And she said, no, that's how many years I had to pray to see him saved. 47 years and eight months. And she said he was baptized and got the Holy Ghost four days before he died. I looked at her and I said, Sister Claudine, I'm going to take that testimony and share it. I said, because I am, I am blown away by your persistency and your consistency and never giving up. That is great faith. I would have been done after like year five. I'm like, man, this homie ain't changing, man. I'm out. 47 years, eight months. How you like them apples? Some of y'all can't pray 47 minutes. <laughs> 47. Well, let's move on. Jesus' miracles don't know distance, nor limitations, nor obstacles. Jesus is able. Amen? As Christians, we are being challenged by these left before us to pursue great faith. Because great faith is a blessing to us, to those around us, to the needs of those that have needs. And it is a powerful way to overcome demonic principalities. Okay? Now, I want you to see what happens next because this part threw me off. It's kind of interesting. This is the only miracle we see Jesus do right now in Tyre and Sidon. And then he bounces. He's like, I'm out. He might drops this thing. He's out. Jesus departed from thence and came nigh unto the Sea of Galilee and went up into a mountain and sat there. Brothers and sisters, you would almost think that Jesus went to Tyre and Sidon just for that woman. You would think that she, he just went there to make sure that her daughter would get delivered from that devil. It resembles the encounter in Samaria with the woman at the well. What does that show us about Jesus' character? Is, is that your encounter with Jesus is not accidental. Your encounter with Jesus was in his plan. And what makes the difference between what you get out of your encounter is how you respond to Jesus in that encounter. See, when I, when I came into that encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, I was like, man, I'm, let's do this. I need this because I know if I don't get this, I'm going to end up dead. How we respond in our encounter will define what the future says about us. Everybody said amen. amen. Now, Jesus knows that there's needs, and yet he goes up to a mountain and waits. Now, I want to show you how this is so, this doesn't make any sense. Can you imagine, Brother Matt, if there was no helicopters, there was no vehicles, there was no technology, and we built all of our hospitals on a mountain? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine how the blind man would get there, the main person would get there, the paralyzed person? Can you imagine how difficult it would be? It'd be like, why are you building a hospital on a mountain? That's what Jesus does. Jesus decides that even though he knows that all kinds of people got needs. Look what the Bible says, verse 30. Great multitudes came unto him, having those that were lame, blind, dumb. They're dumb having a revival right now. We're praying a lot of dumb gets removed in Jesus' name. Maimed and many others and cast them down at Jesus' feet 
and he healed them. Who carried the lame? Somebody that wasn't. Who carried the blind? Who carried the dumb? The smart guy, praise God. Who carried the maimed? Think about that. Jesus introduces us to people that were willing to not just carry someone that couldn't make it to Jesus on their own, but he, he, they, these people were willing to carry him up a mountain. Talk about a great heart. Man, have you ever tried to carry somebody up a mountain? Down a mountain's easy. Up a mountain's hard. And these people are carrying them up to Jesus. The Bible says, insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb speak, the maimed to behold, the lame to walk, the blind to see, and they glorified God. I want you to notice this. Jesus made healing a journey. Jesus made healing a journey, and he healed those that were willing to take a journey and be taken on the journey. Don't miss that. There was two components. The blind man had to recognize he couldn't get to Jesus on his own. The lame man had to recognize he needed somebody else's help. So the miracle took place both because of the guy willing to take somebody and the humility of the person willing to accept the help to get to Jesus. It takes both. If, if, if there was a blind guy at the bottom that said, I'll make my way up to Jesus myself. Can you imagine just the blind guy climbing up and just falling off that ledge? <laughs> Would have been a bad deal. But because he was humble enough to accept, I am blind. I need guidance. I can't walk. Can someone pick me up? Humility and servitude opened up the door for miracles. You got to have both. You just can't have one. Jesus wants to know, number one, how bad do you want to be healed? And how bad do you want to see others healed? Can you imagine the guy carrying the guy over his head that's <sighs> throws him at Jesus' feet, comes right back down. How, how bad do you want to see those miracles? Because God wants to know. Enough to take a journey? Now, if that wasn't enough for a day with Jesus, look at what happens next. Because, you know, living for Jesus is always an adventure. Look at verse 32. We're going to plow through this. Jesus calls his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days I have, and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting lest they faint. Now, this is fascinating. Jesus reveals to us, and this is something that's very important for us, that some things are more important than food. Don't miss that. Some things are actually more important than food. Some things are more important than the cheeseburger. Some things are more important than, well, I, I didn't get a chance to eat tacos El Gordo, so I got to go back soon. But some things are more important, okay? You know what's amazing is, is that Jesus is introducing us to a group of people that had the revelation I can eat the rest of my life, but there are some things that I need right now that require fasting. I'm not sending them away fasting. So Jesus, it, listen, you know you're hungry for what you really need when God has to feed you because you won't eat. Isn't that amazing how this is the opposite? Usually, Jesus is telling people to fast. Jesus is trying to make sure that they, ate, that they eat to break their fast. Hey, can I tell you, I want to have that kind of hunger, that kind of desire. I want to have that kind of burden and passion for, for the miracles of God and the revival that God has for us. I want to have that kind of thing that it doesn't hurt me to push away the plate. I want my need to be more powerful than the growling of my stomach. I was getting quiet on the fasting part, amen. Here's my question. If Jesus is willing to have compassion, why can't we? Look at verse 33. His disciples said unto him, Whence should we have so much bread in the wilderness 
as to fill so great a multitude. I want you to notice the location that they are in and what their need is. Does this remind you of anything? They're in the wilderness and they're hungry. Sounds like Israel of old. Here are some keys to miracles. 1534, Jesus said unto them, How many loaves do you have? They said, We have seven and a few little fishes. Principle number one, bring what you got. Give God something to work with, even if it's just faith. Bring what you got. Okay? Number two, Matthew 15, 35, and he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. You got to be willing to obey. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being the guy who refuses to sit down? My homeboy's going to go hungry. But see, if you'll just sit down and listen to Jesus... You may get fed what you really need. Okay? Look at verse 36. He took the seven loaves and the fishes and he gave thanks and break them and gave it to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And he took the seven loaves and fishes and gave thanks. Are, Are you catching that? Let me read that again. And he took the seven loaves and the fishes and gave thanks. Did you catch that? You know what the Bible's trying to teach us? Be thankful for what you got. Hey, you're doing better than the multitude. They ain't got nothing. Be thankful for what you got. You know what else? Be selfless. Be willing to serve. These are things that stirs the miraculous. Look at this. And they did all eat and were filled, and then they took up broken meat that was left seven baskets full. Hey, can I tell you that God has so many miracles, he has leftovers. He needs vessels to execute these things. And the question is, am I willing to be a vessel that God uses for the miraculous? Am I willing to be a miraculous vessel? Am I willing to be like that Canaanite woman that was like, listen, man, go ahead and preach to him. The Bible wants you to know that there were about 4,000 men beside women and children. He sent them away. He took uh, the ship came into the coast of Magdala. Now, I want, you to, I want you to notice this. Jesus shows them that for God, he's still doing what he's always done. He's feeding his people even in the wilderness. What's the difference? This time the bread is not coming down from heaven as manna, but God himself is with them, giving them bread. In other words, Jesus is giving them a glimpse of who he is. And they're so hungry for food that they can't see it. This is why the Bible says flesh and blood doesn't reveal this. See, if you're, if, if you're overly hungry for carnal stuff, you'll miss spiritual stuff. Jesus is literally reenacting the book of Exodus. We're in the wilderness. Y'all need a miracle. I am the miracle. I am the bread of life. I am the manna sent down from heaven. I'm I'm that guy, but y'all can't even see it because your stomach's growling. I'm telling you, God wants us to get ourselves spiritual. Look at this. As Christians, we too should have compassion for others, and our compassion should fuel us to want to serve and bless others. Our, Our servitude should not come because of pride. It should come because of compassion. Our ministry should not be because of ego. It should be because of compassion. The fuel that we use to do things for God and for others, the fuel needs to be pure. It needs to be because of compassion. I want to help not because I want pats on the back. I want to help because I want to help people. Because I'm I'm so grateful for what God has done in my life that I just want to share with others. We got to have compassionate ministry. Another thing that I learned about Jesus that I thought was fascinating is that Jesus never sends anyone away with nothing. Even the Pharisees left offended. See, when you really come in contact with the Bible, Jesus, you never leave empty handed, you leave with something. These multitudes, they left with all kinds of testimonies. Bro, did you see that lame guy walking? Bro, did you see that blind man? Did you see that? Bro, did you see that? Did you, did you see how he fed us with that? See, 
a relationship with Jesus is always advantageous for the person more than for Jesus. We get more out of him than he gets out of us. And this is why it should humble us to even have access to this. Because it's like, I mean, let's all be real here for a second. What can I actually offer to Jesus? I met a guy that once told me, I'm a great preacher. And I said, bro, you don't think there's people better than you? I'm a great singer. Right, Mariah. Hey, let's get something, let's get something straight. God always gives us more than we give him. And so what that should, what that should do in all of us, it should, it should stir us to want to do and give more. Because we know we can never outgive God. He's just that good. Today, there's some specific prayers that I would like for us to pray in this part 24 as we close. Uh, give me some anesthesia, and uh, you can stand. We're going to pray for a few minutes. I'm actually giving us a little bit more time for prayer uh, because I really do want us to pray about these specific things. Here are the specific prayers that uh, I want our church to pray about right now. And that is, I want us to pray that we pursue and achieve great faith. Like, I, I'm cool with, now faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I love that, but I want to have great faith. Like, I literally want to see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the book of Acts, like, come off the pages of these books. And like, I just want to see it. I want to experience. I want to have that hunger, that persistence, that passion, that drive. I, it's going to take some fasting, folks. It's going to take reality checks. It's going to take all of these things. But we got to pray, God, help me not just pursue it, but achieve great faith. I want us to pray that we can actually see Jesus for who he really is, not just our needs. See, sometimes we only see our needs so we don't see the one that's trying to meet our needs. And that's a distortion. I want us to pray that we have a heart for helping and serving others, that we have empathy and sympathy with people that are going through things that we are not, that we become more like Jesus and we love him more so that we can actually love others more. You know how hard it is? I'm just telling you, I, I meet a lot of sinners, and, and the sinners are so beat up and, and and wrecked by the world and demonic principalities and powers. And then they walk into an environment where the people that represent Christianity don't even believe that God can help them. And so then they get discouraged because they're like, well, man, if they don't even believe that God can help me, maybe he really can help me. I don't want that environment. I want, I would rather... I'd rather Spokane bring us all the maimed, the blind, the deaf, the dumb, the sick, and bring them every service. And I don't really care what happens. I want them all to get healed. If they don't get healed, keep bringing them. Why? Because I literally want to live my life with great faith, being persistent. God, this is the service. God, this is the prayer meeting. God, this is when it's going to happen. God, I want to have that desire. I don't want to live a religiously mundane life. It's not the will of God. If you believe that, would you pray with me? That God would stir us. Maybe there's people that you need a miracle and you haven't fasted about it. Or maybe you just did like a little fast, like, oh, I'm going to fast for an hour. Hey, why don't we do a little bit more? Why don't, we put our, why don't we take our need serious? If your need is serious, you'll take it serious. And you know what's amazing? When my mom got diagnosed, like they, they said it could have been leukemia, Man, it's amazing how all of a sudden you're like, I'll go 10 days without eating. Does God really have to do that to us? Does God really got to let cancer come in? Does God really have to allow situations to come in for us to finally th take it serious enough to be serious about it? See, I, I don't want to be that. That's called a crisis-oriented Christian. It takes crisis to get a response out of you. I want to be preventative. Hey, I am fasting, I am praying, I am seeking. God, you don't have to allow this to happen for me to be stirred. I'm already stirred. You can prevent, I finish with this, 
you can prevent some trials by being persistent, not passive. There's some people that you will spend the rest of your life from trial to trial because you're passive about your faith. But if you'll be persistent about your faith, you'll go from faith to faith and victory to victory. And I believe God wants us to learn from this Canaanite woman. We've got to be persistent. Would you pray with me tonight? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to learn from you. Just another day walking with you, Jesus. You've done so much. I can only imagine being one of the disciples and just seeing you heal hundreds, if not thousands, of people and feed thousands of people. God, I want to be persistent. God, I want to be passionate. Lord, I don't want to be passive about my faith. I want to pursue great faith. I want to be like that widow that came to the unjust judge and kept asking for vengeance. God, I want to be like this Canaanite woman that came to you and she worshipped you before you ever said yes. She threw herself down and she worshipped you and said, Jesus, please help me. My need is greater than my emotional response. God, I pray that you would teach me Hallelujah, to respond to truth the way this Canaanite woman did. This woman could have walked away. She could have got offended. Jesus, she could have literally thrown in the towel, but she decided, no, sir, I'm going to pray until something happens. I'm going to push myself into the presence of Jesus Christ. Oh, God, I pray that you would help us have sympathy and empathy for others, Lord. Help us have a heart to hear the need of others and not criticize them and not write them off and not ask them to leave and not just try to appease the flesh. But, God, I want to be somebody that will pray for people's needs. I want you to entrust me, God with the needs of others. I don't know what it felt like to have a daughter being destroyed by a devil, but I thank God that you do. I thank God that you were willing to step in. I thank God that you were willing to show your disciples that the needs of others really do happen. Oh God, I pray that you would help our church be a refuge for our city. I pray you help our church have a heart for those that are going through situations. I pray God that you help us become intercessors for the needs of others God I pray against powers and principalities I pray against pride and egotism I pray against these things Jesus because people are going through real problems facing real devils with real needs and I want our church to believe that Jesus can help that Jesus could deliver that Jesus can can heal that Jesus can step in that the power of the name of Jesus is still powerful help us tonight Jesus create an environment for the miraculous help us tonight Jesus be Christians because there seems to be a connection between Christianity and the miraculous power of your word and your spirit and God I don't want to be religious I don't want to be just another Pharisee or Sadducee or scribe but God I want to be a willing vessel I want to be a vessel that you can use to touch others I want to be a vessel God of glory and honor for your name I want to see miracle signs and wonders Lord we have people in our church that are sick oh I wonder if somebody would pray with me for our sick brothers and sisters God, you know the sicknesses in our church. God, you know the pain that flows through their body. You know the tears that have ran down their face because of the sorrow that sickness has brought. Oh God, I pray against lupus today by the authority of your name, Jesus. I pray against cancers today. Oh God, I, I pray against MS today. I pray against every disease that would come against the church of the living God. I pray against the diseases that are destroying the lives of people in our city, in our families, Jesus. I'm just going to be persistent, God. I'm going to pray in the name of Jesus Christ. 
by your stripes we are healed. I want to see people delivered. I pray against the devils that are destroying the families of people we know. I pray against the devils trying to destroy the children we know. I pray against the devils wrecking marriages we know. In the name of Jesus Christ, we come against every power and principality. We cast you out in Jesus' name. You have no authority. You have no power. You have no right over the children of God because we are God's people. We have God's name. We live by God's word. We're filled with God's spirit. Oh, I pray, God, that you would open up the windows of the miraculous. Oh, Jesus, hear our cry today. Hear our hunger and our prayers, God. Hear our desire, God. Hear our persistence, God. Hear us tonight, Jesus. These needs are more important than a meal. These needs are more than sorrow and, and surface deep. But God, I'm driven. I'm hungry. I'm starving for the miracle signs and wonders. Oh, I pray that somebody would pray with me. God, I'm hungry for our backsliders to go to heaven. I'm hungry for our marriages to be restored. I'm hungry, Jesus, for families to be planted and established. I'm hungry for prodigals to make their way back before they die in sin. I'm hungry, Jesus, for people to be like the Canaanite woman and be willing to have a reality check. I'm hungry for humility to be a part of our character. I'm hungry for faith and great faith to drive us, God. I am a hungry Jesus to be more like you. I'm hungry to learn from you. I'm hungry to love you. I'm hungry to love others, God. That is my, oh, it's my driving force. It's my fuel. God, baptize us with compassion, God. Baptize us with a genuine care for one another, God. I don't want it to be surface level. I want it to be genuine. I want it to drive me to prayer. God, I want to pray for my brothers and sisters' needs. I want to pray for the needs that I see out there in the world. I want to pray for the needs of our city. I want to believe in the power of prayer. I want to believe in persistent prayer. I want to believe in faith and prayer. Jesus, I want this God. In the name of Jesus Christ. I want to believe for husbands to come to church. I want to believe for wives to come to church. I want to pray for kids to never backslide. I want to pray that we raise up our children in the truth. Oh God of heaven and of earth. We come before you alone because nobody has all power in heaven and earth but you. And we come before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. You said we can come boldly before the throne of grace and ask for help in time of need. Oh, I wonder if somebody would pray. Come on. I, I, I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost sent this man to tell you, hey, there's great faith. There's great faith in the pews tonight. There's great faith available to us, but we got to want it. We got to desire it. We got to pursue it. We got to be persistent for it. Halaboshanda, Jesus. Help us tonight, God. Yalalabashanda. Halalabashanda. Oh, we love you, Jesus. Oh, we love you, Jesus. We're here learning about you because we love you. Halabosa. We're here learning about you because we want to be more like you. We're here learning about your character because we need it. Hallelujah. You said, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. I want to be humble. I want to be compassionate. Hallelujah. I want to be sympathetic. Halaboshanda. I want to be empathetic towards others. I don't want to have a rough heart. I want to have a sweet spirit, God. I know this world tries to convince us to be tough. Oh, but I want to be sensitive to the things of God. I want to be sensitive to the ways of God. I want to be sensitive to the word of God. Yolobosha, I want my life to be built to worship you. I want to worship you when you tell me yes. I want to worship you when you tell me no. 
I want to worship you before you answer me. I want to worship you because you're worthy. I want to pray because you're worthy. Hallelujah. I don't deserve any of this. I'm grateful for what I have. I may not have everything I want, but I have more than I deserve. I may not have everything that I think I need, but I have everything that I really need. God, you're so good. I want to be thankful for what I do have, God. I got a prayer life. I got a God that loves me. I got the blood that forgave me. I got a name that cast out devils. I got a name that heals diseases. You've got me through valleys. You've got me through trials. I'm still standing, God. Everybody threw in the towel, but I'm still here. The world said I was unfixable, and I'm still here. I'm thankful, God, for what you've done. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. I want to have great faith, oh God. Hallelujah, let it be a blessing. Hallelujah to everyone connected to my life. God, I want to have great faith. God, I believe, but help my unbelief. Come on, somebody, there's people under the sound of my voice. God hasn't healed you in a couple of years and you've already stopped praying for healing. Oh, I pray that you just keep on praying. And if God does it, great. If he doesn't do it in this lifetime, he will in the next. But let's not stop praying in faith. Let's not stop believing. Let's not let that become part of the unbelief that hinders the belief for others. Let us keep on praying. Let us keep on worshiping. Let us keep on believing. I'd rather be ignorant I'd rather be ignorantly in love with Jesus and just keep on believing and worshiping than live from unbelief to unbelief, from failure to failure, from complaint to complaint. Hallelujah, God, creating us clean hearts, renewing us right spirits. I want to see it. Yalala bando lobo shata. I want to taste it. I want to see it. Hallelujah, Jesus. Great is thy faithfulness, O oh God. And because of that, let our faith be great. Yolo lobo shanda la la basata. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Does anybody got a Rolex? Anybody got a Rolex? I do. I didn't buy it, sister. Let me just tell you how God works. I don't care about things. God just keeps giving me things. I was preaching, brother. I had just put the microphone down, preaching this Sunday. And somebody walked up to me, took their Rolex off, and put an $8,000 Rolex on my wrist and said, God said to give it to you. Wow. Isn't it amazing that when you don't care about things, God gives you more? When you just care about him and you just love him and you just want to serve him and be a blessing to him, God just shows you little glimpses. Listen, I got all this under control. I'm just telling you. And yes, I kept the Rolex. I was going to wear it today, but I felt like, you know what? <laughs> I'll show you guys a picture after service. I took a picture of my wrist, I just, and I thought to myself, I thought I'd never be wearing a Rolex. <laughs> but man, they put it on my wrist, I'd hate to be offensive, so I had to keep it on for a little bit. I tried to give it back, I don't want it. And they, God said so, and I'm just like, that's right. I'm thinking like, man, this guy's about to get 10 Rolexes. <laughs> he might send me another one before it's over. But I, I'm telling you that because I'm telling you, 
when you just start living with great faith, listen, God's in charge. God knows what he's doing. God has out power. God has all the ways. How God's going to do it, he's going to figure it out. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm preaching about miraculous. I'm preaching about God's going to give us a building. We're going to buy a building. God's going to figure out the finances, blah, blah, blah. And a man just walks up and gives me a Rolex. And that's God's way of saying, hey, if you'll keep believing, I'll keep doing the miraculous. Hey, just keep believing. I'm not giving you the Rolex. <laughs> Although it does fit you in that blue suit. Because it, ha it has that, it has the blue. If God speaks to me, we'll talk. Hey, listen, God, God is fixing to do some miracles. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Well, why don't you come up here? We're going to pray for you. Okay. Okay. 